Hello and welcome to Sunday Catch Up. I'm delighted you can join us. Uh, wherever you are at this time, I pray that God will bless you as you worship. And I'm excited to say we've got three words later on to help us live as disciples of Jesus. I hope those three words are helpful to you. Um, but before we go any further, as usual, it's time for the weekly news. Hello and welcome to the Trinity Cafe. Did you know that tomorrow, Monday the 21st of February, marks the start of Fair Trade Fortnight? And the theme for this year's Fair Trade Fortnight is choose the world you want. Now that's a great theme, isn't it? And it really makes you think because we're in a very privileged position that the decisions we make about what to buy, they do actually impact our world and other people in our world. And it's good for us to take time to reflect on the decisions we're making. Uh, now, let, let me just give you two reasons why fair trade is a positive thing. So firstly, and probably the one we most know about, is it's a way of ensuring that the farmers get a good price for their produce, which sounds like a good way to love our neighbor to me. But secondly, as well as that, if they're getting a fair price for their product, it means they've got money to invest in environmentally sustainable farming methods as well. And so actually, by engaging with fair trade, we're actually helping the environment and being more environmentally friendly too. So it's fair trade fortnight and we're invited to choose the world we want. Well, what world do you want? I'm delighted to say that here in the Trinity Cafe, uh, we use fair trade tea, coffee, sugar, cocoa. And did you know it's actually not that hard to buy some things that are fair trade? In fact, it's quite hard to buy a banana in the supermarkets that isn't fair trade. Perhaps it would be good for all of us to be aware of the decisions that we make when we're in the supermarkets about what we buy. And perhaps just be a bit more aware of the labels that are there to help us make good decisions that actually help love other people and help love the planet that God has given us. Fair Trade Fortnight starts tomorrow. If you were in church last week, you'll have um, been all excited because James came up and told us that they'd had a wonderful answer to prayer and how Lydia was well on the way to being healed and I for one was really excited. And now we're all gonna be looking about this book, because we've all got those prayers that haven't been answered, haven't we? Um, God on mute, engaging the silence of unanswered prayer. If you haven't read it, please do. There are bits that are tough to read. I cried, and I don't normally cry at anything. Um, you laugh out loud. Uh, Pete Gregg is the um, sort of figurehead of the 24-7 prayer movement and he said he felt a bit embarrassed writing a book on unanswered prayer but let's be honest when they're unanswered we haven't got any answers so it really is a great book to read. Um, he sort of broadly pops it into sort of three sort of categories. He talks about a heart question and he says how am I going to get through this? And he links that with Jesus and the disciples on Maundy Thursday. You can't get more desperate situation than that, I wouldn't have thought. Unless. Then the head question comes in. Why aren't my prayers being answered? And on Good Friday, if Jesus is praying a prayer and he's saying why aren't my prayers being answered? We're not alone in asking that question. And then he talks about a soul question. Where is God when heaven is silent? And he links that in with Holy Saturday. At the back of the book, there are um, various quotes from people about prayer and whether it's unanswered or whether it was unanswered for a really good reason. And um, Billy Graham's daughter says she's really pleased that God didn't answer her prayers. Otherwise, she would have married the wrong man several times. So, 
So there, are, you know, some unanswered air, unanswered prayer is that's okay, but. He really does, through his own personal experience, through experiences of friends, um, historic people, people in the Bible, he really does be brutally honest and he says what all of us must have said at some time or another. Um, I've done this little thing in the other services and I've read a little bit, no spoilers, and um, so I thought I would just share this little bit with you. I promise I won't try and do an accent. Um, this is a prayer, an unknown soldier of the American Civil War. He captured these priorities about the blessings of unanswered prayer. I asked for strength that I might achieve. He made me weak that I might obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given grace that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I received nothing that I asked for, all that I hoped for. My prayer was answered. I was most blessed. First of all, a prayer for James and ourselves. Loving God, please be with James as he uses the Bible to teach and encourage us this evening. And help us to take your word into our minds, our hearts and our lives. Amen. Our Bible reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 12 to 25. Jesus begins to preach. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus calls his first disciples. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus heals the sick. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, 
And people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed. And he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Well, good evening. And this evening, we are going to be thinking about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Someone who follows Jesus. Now, how would you sum that up if you had to sum up what it means to be a disciple of Jesus? So imagine, imagine someone who isn't yet a Christian comes and says, tell me, what would it mean for me if I became a disciple of Jesus? What would it be like? What would you say? Apart from that first thing where you go, wow, this is so exciting. Somebody's just asked me what it's like to be a disciple of Jesus. We love those moments. But there's so much that could be said, isn't there? And there's always that temptation to embellish it a bit, isn't there? To make, uh, paint a slightly rosier picture than the reality, where we kind of are tempted to say, oh, well, it's wonderful, it's all peace and love and forgiveness, and your life will be so much better. And of course, it's never as simple as that. So what could you say? What could you say that would sum up what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Well, I've got three words for us that I hope will do that. Here they are for you. They are repent, follow, and listen. Simple as that. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, I did not come up with those words. I pinched them. In fact, you'll have probably noticed, I pinched them from our Bible reading, from Jesus himself, because that's what he teaches in what we've just had read to us. He gives us three crucial facts of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Three things that should underlie every Christian life, from the moment we become a Christian until that moment we see Jesus face to face in glory. And if you count yourself as a disciple of Jesus, then these three things should be at the heart of your life. And you get all this important stuff in what we've just had read in Matthew chapter 4. Now, um, I want you to think of this as a bit like a sandwich, okay? Now, I like sandwiches. In fact, it's really, I like all food. It's just the sandwiches are food, so that means I like them. Um, but I want you to imagine a sandwich. And at one side of the sandwich, we've got the first three and a bit chapters of Matthew's uh, book, the Gospel of Matthew. Okay, there we get the key moments in Jesus' life. You know, the birth, his baptism his temptations, they're telling us about who Jesus is, helping us understand that this is the Messiah. And that simply means that he's God's chosen king. And in fact, at the beginning of our Bible reading, just into chapter 4, we had that reminded to us as Matthew quotes from Isaiah. Did you recognise those verses that Matthew was, was uh, writing there? He's taken them from Isaiah and they're often read out at carol services. You know, those walking in darkness have seen a great light. And that light is Jesus. It's that point again. Jesus is the Messiah, the light of the world. Okay, that's the first half. Then the other side of the sandwich, we've got chapters 5 to 7. Now, you might know that as the Sermon on the Mount. This is where Jesus gets up and preaches. And he teaches how... He, as God's chosen king, can help people understand his kingdom. But between those two bits, the life events and the teaching, there's this little bit in chapter 4, where Jesus is preparing people to be part of his kingdom. He's telling them what a, being a disciple of the king looks like. Now, if you've ever started work, perhaps at a new company, you may have had one of those orientation sessions. Um, well, it's a bit like that, what Jesus is doing here. He, he's pointing people in the right direction. 
Giving them the right orientation so that they know which direction to go and what they're doing next as a disciple. So this is really helpful for those, anybody who isn't a Christian, is looking in and wondering, what does it mean to be a disciple? Well, here's, here's the answer from Jesus. But if you are already a disciple of Jesus, this is helpful for you because it's a bit like a health check. We can check in and make sure we're on the right path. So let's dig in to this part of the Bible, see how Jesus helps us be focused as disciples, and we'll start with the word repent. Because that's what happens. The Messiah is here, and Jesus says repent. Now this is a bit of a surprise. The first thing Jesus does when he begins his ministry is preach, and his first word is repent. And that itself is a bit of a shock. Because I wonder, if you were launching a new ministry, would you start by public preaching outside, and would you start with the word repent? Any takers? Not many. Well, I'm not surprised. It's funny, isn't it? You know, we prefer perhaps to quietly tell someone that God loves them. And there's nothing wrong with doing that, of course. But Jesus isn't so shy, is he? He's really happy to be upfront about what is needed to be a disciple of Jesus. Now, we don't get all the sermon notes here, we just get the headline. But it's pretty simple, isn't it? Uh, chapter 4, verse 17. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, that is exactly the same message that John the Baptist preached in chapter 3, verse 2. You might remember that if you've been with us in previous weeks. Now, we were told in verse 12 that actually John the Baptist has now been put in prison. The baton has changed hands. It's now Jesus preaching, but it's exactly the same message. And it's all focused around this word, repent, which can be confusing. Why do we need to repent? And how often do we need to repent? Is it just once when we become a Christian? Is it every time we sin? Is it every Sunday? How do we understand what it means to repent? Well, it's worth remembering that Jesus is speaking to people who aren't yet Christians. So let's start there and work forwards in what he's trying to tell us. The word repent is not a word you'd often hear in the local pub in Nailsey. Um, but it literally means changing your mind. Okay? Simple as that. Repent is to change your mind. And Jesus is making the point that everyone needs to change their mind about God. That is the crucial change that happens when somebody becomes a Christian. You see, by nature, we assume that God isn't on our side we figure that we're going to need to put ourselves first because God isn't looking out for us. So we're best off, we think, ignoring his authority, ignoring his ways, and living life by our rules, the way we want to. The big switch comes when we realise that actually God does love us, that his ways aren't bad, but they're good, and that we can trust him for everything. But for that to happen, that requires a lot of humility. We've got to admit we were totally wrong. We've got to say sorry. And we've got to start living in a whole new direction. It's that change of mind. In fact, it's a 180 degree turn, if you remember what 180 degrees are from school. It is moving from completely one direction to completely opposite direction. It's about choosing God rather than choosing away from him. It's about choosing that path for the rest of our lives. Has anybody been watching the Winter Olympics? No? Not really? Okay, we're not really... What? One or two? Okay. One or two brave people willing to admit they're watching the Winter Olympics. Well, my son, he loves the snowboarding which means I've watched a bit of snowboarding too. And it is phenomenal. 
some of the, so you're nodding now, you're willing to admit it now. It's the air that these guys and girls get, you know, six metres in the eye, in the air, uh, kicking their uh, boards around. And, um, of course, they can do amazing tricks, can't they? They go up facing one direction, they spin round, and they come back facing the other direction. It's absolutely amazing. That is a picture of repentance. You start going one direction, and you turn completely around and go the other direction. That change of mind is to repent. Now, it may be that you made that big switch that you repented many years ago. In which case, that is wonderful. Praise the Lord for that. But as Christians, we never stop living a life of repentance. It's a bit like a marriage. You know, there's the day where someone says, I will. But then every day after that is about living that out. And it's exactly the same with discipleship as well. Every day that we follow Jesus is about facing the right way. Making sure we're turning towards God and not away from him. And when we do trip and stumble and find ourselves facing the wrong way through a bad decision, we need to admit that, say sorry, and choose to face God again. So if we were to do a health check of disciples, we, we know that change of heart begins our journey with Jesus. And it's also an important part of our daily journey with Jesus. So the question would be, how does repentance feature in your daily life? Is choosing to face God and turning away from the things that take us away from him, is that a part of your life and your journey? Well, that's one word. Let's repent. Another lesson from Jesus about being a disciple of the king. Because the Messiah is here, we need to follow Okay, we've repented, we're on a new path. But to stay on that path, we need to follow our king. So, we heard what happened for Simon Peter and Andrew, and for James and John. That literally meant getting out of their fishing boats, leaving their nets, and going wherever Jesus went. To learn ministry, and then to do ministry. Now, for us, it's a little bit different because we can't actually do that. Jesus might call us to leave our families and our homes and our businesses, but he might not. Either way, he does call us to learn ministry and then to do ministry. Because, you know, don't fall into the trap of thinking that ministry is just for leaders at the front of church. Ministry is just serving We can all do that. And we can all do it in the place where God has called us to do it. In this case, for these disciples, Jesus focuses on the call to evangelism. Now, if you don't know what evangelism means, it's a long and fancy word, and it simply means fishing for people. Isn't that a great definition that Jesus gives us? It's fishing for people. It's going out to bring people in in to God's kingdom, you know, so they can experience the wonderful joy and peace with God that we have through his forgiveness. Now, just ponder for a moment. Imagine you were working in recruitment and you were tasked with finding some people who would make great evangelists, people who would be great at sharing the Christian faith, You'd draw up your list of skills and you'd look down your lists of who you might recruit. Here's my question. Do you think that you'd look and approach some fishermen on the basis that they must have transferable skills? That if they can catch fish, they can work with people. Would you do that? I don't think so. I mean, we understand what Jesus is telling us about the similarities, but really, they're not transferable skills, are they? Just because you're good with a fish and a net and a rod, it doesn't mean you're any good with people. But that's the point. When Jesus looked at these rough and ready fishermen, he didn't see expert evangelists ready to go. Just like when he looks at you, he doesn't necessarily see an expert fisher of people. But that doesn't stop him calling you 
to be part of his work. Are you willing to give it a go? You see, there's this great phrase that I find really helpful. You have to stop and think about it for a minute, but it's really profound when you get your head around it. Jesus doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. See what that's saying? Jesus doesn't call people who are already equipped with the gifts and skills and are ready to go. No, he calls people and then he equips them. It's like on the job training. It's just that the job isn't like working in a mechanic's garage, it's working in ministry. It's training in ministry. So here's another health check question for you. If you're a disciple of Jesus, how's your fishing going at the moment? Now I'm not a fisherman myself in the sense that I don't go fishing for fish. I once did go fishing for crabs, um, just once. It wasn't all that successful. I didn't catch much, much. It did teach me how much patience and perseverance you need to fish. But how are you doing in fishing for people? Are you still fishing patiently, persevering? Or have you packed up and gone home? Finally, third aspect of discipleship, we get to that third word, listen. This is a crucial part of being a disciple of Jesus. You've got to listen. Now, um, this is all taken from the last section of our Bible reading, verses 23 to 25. And to be fair, it's not just about listening, but that kind of sums it up. They're actually uh, writing about what Jesus got up to. As Jesus went around, he did two things. One was teaching. The other was healing. But both pointed to the kingdom. Jesus he, he either showed what the kingdom is like with his teaching, you know, explaining what the kingdom's going to be like, who's going to be there, what behaviour is expected in the kingdom. He either showed what the kingdom of like, is like with his teaching or with his actions. And he healed people, showing people a glimpse of heaven. That he, that God's chosen king, can reverse all that is bad and painful in our world. So a key part of being a disciple of Jesus is looking at what Jesus did and looking at what Jesus said. In other words, it's reading this, the Bible, isn't it? Because this is where it's all recorded for us. We can look carefully at what he did and what he said. Final health check. For a disciple of Jesus, do you listen well? For those of us who've been Christians for a while, it's good to check we're still listening well. You know, they say in a marriage that over time people develop selective hearing. Well, could that be true as a disciple as well? We need to listen really well. So how about you in all this? We've thought about discipleship. And if you are sitting there as somebody who considers themselves a disciple of Jesus, how are you doing? Are you living that life of repentance? You know, facing towards God and, and readjusting all the time, saying sorry and turning to him again. Are you following the king? Secondly, following him and obeying his call reaching out and sharing the faith. And thirdly, are you listening? Are you listening to his teaching and his ways? Carving out time to make listening a priority. It's not easy, but in the strength of God's spirit, he can help us on this journey. Let's pray that where perhaps we aren't as healthy as a disciple as we would like to be, God would work in us and show us how we can be the disciple Jesus calls us to be. So let's pray. Let's pray for that now. Our loving Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for his teaching and the way he shows us what it means to be a disciple. Father God, we know there are so many competing priorities in our heads each day for what to do and how to live. Please keep these three principles from Jesus in the forefront of our minds as we live lives of repentance, as we seek to follow Jesus' call to reach out 
And as we seek to make time to listen well, that you might lead us on and help us to be the disciples you've called us to be. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. to us.